38. Isaiah 38. We'll be in a series in Isaiah on Wednesday evenings. And uh, I have been sort of preaching messages that I won't preach in series uh, on, on occasion. You may have noticed the last several Wednesday evenings. Uh, actually, we have been looking at prophecy of the Messiah in Isaiah or evidences that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And those will be points that we'll, we'll uh, brush over, but they won't be uh, messages in, that we'll cover um, as we're preaching thematically through Isaiah in the next several weeks. So those are some things that are coming up for the new year. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy new year. I'm so glad that you made it here this morning. And uh, I'm sad for those who did not make it because what a way to start your new year, missing church. <laughs> That'd be a real bummer, wouldn't it? Missing Sunday school. Um, folks, you, you uh, and I need to realize how much God can do if we will just believe. And I'm not one of these people who wears a t-shirt with a generic believe or whatever on it. I don't mean believe on the basketball court, believe in my ability, or believe in, um, you know, just believe in a person. But I mean believe in God and His promises. And I don't believe in the name it, claim it theology, but I believe in that if God promised it, He'll deliver it. And God's promised some great things. And we, I believe, have seen very little comparatively of what we could actually see if we would just believe God. Well, I want to go down to Isaiah chapter 38 this morning. And I want to ask the question uh, in just a moment. And that question would be, oh, look, Charlie came to church. Hi, Charlie. Good morning. Uh, the question I would like to ask this morning would be, if you were giving, given a message like we we're going to see Hezekiah have here, that you are going to die, your sickness is unto death, how would you set your house in order? And so let's read the text, and then, then I'll ask the question. And I want to look at some important things, and uh, we will make application of it. I think it would be great to start our year off uh, with some of the concepts here in Isaiah 38. In those days, was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city, and this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which is gone down in the sun dial of Ahaz, Ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees, by which degrees it was gone down. The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord, in the land of the living. I shall behold no man no more with the inhabitants of the world. My age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off like a weaver in my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness from day to night wilt thou make an end of me. I reckon till morning that as a lion so will he break all my bones. From day to night will thou make me an end of me. Like a crane or a swallow so did I chatter. I did mourn as a dove, mine eyes with fail looking upward. O Lord, I am oppressed, undertake for me. What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it. I shall go softly all my years in the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things in the life of my spirit. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness. But thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Boy, how'd you, how would you have known that verse was going to come in the middle of a man's death prayer? I want to read that again. Um, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast love 
to my soul, hast in love to my soul, delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee, they that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me, therefore we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. For Isaiah had said, Let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. Hezekiah also had said, What is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? Well, this is a very, very important passage of Scripture about a man's life. And why is it important? Why is it significant? Well, a couple of reasons. In 2 Kings chapter 18, we are introduced to Hezekiah as one of the great kings of Israel. And arguably, Hezekiah was one of the best kings Israel ever had. Born to wicked parents, a wicked family, born uh, with a generational tendency to do wickedly. And Hezekiah was a man who was born at age 25, became king of Israel, and determined that he was going to be a godly king for Judah. In the days of Hezekiah, the Sennacherib, I believe it was, or Reza, the representative for him from Assyria, had come into Samaria or come into Israel and literally taken everybody captive and destroyed those individuals. And he was coming down to Judah. Uh, if you were to read 2 Kings 18 and 19, you'd hear this speech that Reza, this representative for the Assyrian king, came, stood on the wall in Judah and spoke in the tongue, in the Hebrew tongue, so that everybody there could hear him, and said, don't, what he, or, uh, don't trust Hezekiah. If you think that you can trust Hezekiah, who has committed himself to the Lord, if you think that the God of Hezekiah can deliver you, you got a thing or two coming. And they said to this man, Reza, they had already cut off the gold from the doors of the temple and taken the gold plating out of different places in the temple and sent it to the Assyrian king. Hezekiah had written him a letter and said, listen, whatever tribute you lay on me, I'll pay it. They'd done everything they could to comply, but what they wanted was to eliminate Israel's godly king, or Judah's godly king. So, this man Reza comes up and speaks these strong words in front of everybody, all the men there, and just basically said, you're going to eat excrement. You're going to drink waste. You are going to... All these things are going to happen if you trust Hezekiah. If you trust Hezekiah, you're only trusting his God. And then he goes down a list of kings that he conquered and asked, what did their gods do for them? Well, the only difference is that Hezekiah's God was God. And uh, let's go to 2 Kings 18. I want to look at Hezekiah's response. Hezekiah, I, I was about to say earlier as you're turning to 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah distinguished himself because he's one of two kings in Israel that tore down the high places. One of only two kings in Israel that actually eliminated alternative worship of God. Distinguished himself that way. Uh, you ever ask yourself, whatever happened to the brazen serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness? You know, if you think about that brazen serpent, that was a pretty special, pretty special symbolic, um, or pretty special symbol of faith in the cross. Jesus Himself, in explaining the Gospel, used the illustration of the brass serpent in the wilderness. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So the brass serpent was the greatest symbol of faith in Israel. But Hezekiah smashed it because people started worshiping it as a serpent instead of as an innate object that represented salvation by faith. And Hezekiah smashed that thing and broke it up, tore it up, because he didn't want people to worship anything but God. He's a good king. Um, I want to look at a couple of things that Hezekiah did when he was threatened. First of all, uh, in verse 1 of... Well, that's chapter 19. I said turn to 18. We'll look at a couple of things. Uh, in verse 17, the king of Assyria, of chapter 18, sent Tartan and Rapsuris and Rabshika from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. 
And they went up and came to Jerusalem, and they were come up. They came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah. Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, But they are vain words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which of a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that trust on him. Okay, so Hezekiah had a friendship with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And so this man, Rabshakeh, said, Hey, you think Pharaoh is going to help you? Do you trust Pharaoh? I'll tell you what trusting Pharaoh is like. If you have a staff and you put down, you have a short, you know, like a cane, it would be the illustration we would use, like a straight pole cane without a curve on it. And you put it down to lean on for support and it goes through your hand. It pierces through your hand. That's how much help, that's how much help Egypt would be for you. Do you trust Pharaoh? In other words, what he's saying, and I believe it to be true, would be that if you trust that Pharaoh can deliver you, you're trusting someone who actually would betray you. Alright, so don't trust Pharaoh. Hey, is that a good point? Could be valid if you're trusting Pharaoh. Then he says, uh, in verse... Uh, 22. But if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God... Is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, Ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my lord the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee two thousand horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants, and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, Go up against this land and destroy it. Then said Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna, and Joah, and Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. And talk not with us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said unto them, Hath my master sent to thy master and thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive and of honey, that ye may live and not die, and hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land, out of the hand of the king of Assyria? And the answer to that is, no. Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of uh, Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Assyria, Samaria out of mine hand? Samaria would be the, the other ten tribes of Israel. Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand? The people held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was saying, Answer him not. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah the son of Asaph the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, and told him the words of Rabshakeh. Okay, so you see the threat here? It's pretty demoralizing, actually. And it actually shows the wisdom of King Hezekiah to tell the people, Don't answer. Um, I have learned, and hopefully am still learning, that if you don't have an answer, the best answer is not to answer. Don't in ministry, one of the greatest mistakes I've ever done, um, the greatest mistakes I've ever made have been to give an answer to people because they demand it. 
You know, what are you going to do? Well, I, if you don't know what you're going to do, don't tell people what you're going to do. <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of times people say, well, they, they'll give you an ultimatum. And they'll give you a choice between two things that aren't good. And they want a choice. They want you to make a decision. As though you have to make a decision. You know, there's always a third choice. There's always a third choice. You can trust God. You can either do this or this. Your two choices. Or you can trust God. And the people were told, you can either trust Hezekiah and we're going to come and kill you. Or you can trust the king of Assyria and just give him a big gift. And until he comes to deport you, you can live in your house and you can eat the fruit of your vine and, and eat the fruit of your fig tree. And we're going to come and take you to another land that's similar to where you live at. We're going to deport you. And when you live there, you will get to live in a land like this one. And, uh, you know, and you can recognize the king of Assyria as your king. Or you could trust Hezekiah. Well, that's problematic. And Hezekiah had given a wise command to the people. He said, don't answer. What are you going to do? And the man said on the wall, Answer me! If you don't answer, I'm going to take your answer. I'm going to answer for you. And they didn't say a word. Not a word. Do you think they were afraid? Sure. Was there precedent for them to, to fear? Oh yeah. Things had gone very badly in Samaria. Things had gone badly for anyone who had opposed the, the Assyrians. They were ruthless, cruel people. They were very dangerous and they were very, very proud. And they were not so much concerned with anything except that they were known as being the greatest in the world. I mean, that's, they really just wanted to conquer the world. And if you were to say, okay, you're the greatest, you're the best, and we will pay tribute to you, and we'll, just, we'll be your slaves, that was okay with that, but nothing else was. Or they could trust God. And the king of Assyria sent the message saying, don't you let Hezekiah make you trust God. So what did Hezekiah do? Well, the Bible says in verse 1 of the next chapter, it came to pass, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priest, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. The first thing that Hezekiah did was he went to the Lord. The first thing he did when he had a major problem was he went to the Lord. The second thing he did was he went to the mouthpiece of God, and that was Isaiah. Hey, Hezekiah didn't have 2 Kings to read. He didn't have the prophecy of Isaiah to read. He had a relationship with a God who he had, uh, who, whom he had honored by faith. In other words, he read God's law. He put away the high places because God's law said don't have high places. Uh, but this whole idea of going to the Lord was something that no one else was doing. Whereas if you think, well, you know what, he, he decided to go and fellowship with the people that trusted God. No, Hezekiah was the guy that trusted God. And the second thing he did, he said, I want to, I want to hear from God. And he knew that Isaiah was the prophet that God spoke through, and so he sent for Isaiah for help. Okay? Uh, in verse... Four. Here's the here's the answer. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to approach reproach the living God. And he will approve the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So here is Ramshika, 
And he is surrounding the city. And he's demanding an answer. And they didn't give him an answer, but he's not going to leave without an answer. He's going to, he is going to wreak havoc before he leaves. And God said to Isaiah, tell him this, I'll make him go home. He heard a rumor. He heard a, that there was war back home and he had to go home. And that was the end of Rabshakeh. In other words, God just took the whole problem away from Isaiah, from Hezekiah. He just took it away. Now let me ask you a question. Did the people, as a result of this, look at Hezekiah and say, wow, what a great ruler. What a great king. What providential deliverance. Well, the answer to that question is perhaps, but probably not. You know, it's very interesting when God does amazing things, how little, how seldom we acknowledge Him and give Him the glory for it. It really is astonishing. Here God has, has brought great deliverance to Hezekiah, to Israel, and yet they don't really know if God did it or not because, I mean, Rabshakeh just left on his own. And a chain of circumstances caused his demise. My question for you is this. Will 2017 be a year that you acknowledge that God is on the throne? And that events are not simply happening because of men's decisions, but that God is one who is orchestrating events within which men make their decisions. See, this man, Rabshakeh, made a decision to go to a place and was destroyed, but God caused the circumstances that caused his decision to be made. God was on the throne. Uh, I don't want to get into silly conversations and debate God's sovereignty. My friend, God's sovereign. Period. Does God allow men, does God may allow men to make decisions and to do things? Yeah, He certainly does. And that's not a threat to His sovereignty. It's amazing how individuals can take one statement and create an opposition in it where there is none. Okay, now, um, let's look at chapter 19. And uh, let's look at uh, verse 8. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna. For he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And when he had heard say of Tirhaka, king of Ethiopia, behold, he's come out to fight against thee, he sent messengers again unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee. <laughs> Don't trust God saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shall thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Hauron and Rezif and the children of Eden, which were in Thalassar? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arpad and the king of the city of Sepharvim of Hena and Iva? And Hezekiah received the letter by the, of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Friend, Hezekiah was the great king in Israel not because he was known as David as a mighty man. Truth of the matter is I look at Hezekiah and as I look at David, I think if I had to go hand-to-hand -to -hand in combat against one of those guys... It wouldn't be David that I'd choose. Right? And I'm not saying Hezekiah is a weakling, but you just don't see Hezekiah as being this strong military leader when he gets a threatening letter and goes into the house of the Lord and lays on his face and just says, God, help! But Hezekiah, make no mistake, was a greater king of Israel than David was. God said so. He distinguished himself as king of Israel by his faith in God. And I'm not saying that there is a comparison, humanly speaking, that we ought to make between the two. I'm just telling you that Hezekiah distinguished himself. And what is very fascinating to me about Hezekiah's distinction is that if you want to read interesting stories, you wouldn't read about him, you'd read about David. David slew Goliath. <laughs> man, you read about the military prowess of David. I, man, I remember being a kid and reading about David. I didn't have to, I read a lot of books, but I'll tell you, if I 
have a Bible and want to read something interesting, I'd go read about David. I read about him being pursued by Saul, hiding in caves and cutting the back of, the, of Saul's garment off and coming outside and saying, look at this, Saul. Sneaking into Saul's camp and taking his pitcher. Taking his, you know, right, right where he's sleeping with, with uh, Abner, defend, not Abner, Joab, defending him. No, Abner defending him. I always mix up Joab and Abner. Uh, with uh, Abner laying beside him and, and sneaking out on the hillside yelling, Abner! Abner! Wake up, Abner! What kind of a bodyguard are you? I just sneaked into your camp and took this from Saul. Right, David, what an exciting guy. Um, David and his mighty men. Those guys... Those guys were ninjas before they were ninjas. <laughs> they were assassins. They were killers. I mean, they were, they were some tough dudes. Uh, they was an old man when Absalom, his son, tried to overthrow him. And Absalom couldn't nearly succeed. David was a mighty leader. I mean, when, when David died, he told Solomon, you've got to kill Joab. Because he'll be out of control. But David was able to remain king of Israel when Joab was his general. I mean, David was a strong, mighty man. And Hezekiah just doesn't compare in terms of military strength. You don't see Hezekiah stepping out and saying, send a champion and I'll fight him. That was Hezekiah. Or that was not Hezekiah. Hezekiah goes into the into the house of God and he lays out and starts bawling. And then he does the wisest thing any person could ever do. He says, God, you've got a problem. <laughs> you know what they said about you? They said that you wouldn't be faithful. They said that I could trust you, but you can't be trusted. They said, if I destroy the high places and I make the people to worship you and, and uh, if we worship you in truth... I've got to turn this, this speaker down. It's out of proportion here. If I, if I trust you, you'll betray me. God, you've got a problem. You know, you hear what they're saying about you? Friend, I just want to tell you something. It would be too bad if in 2017 you and I give people the impression that Christianity is a clever religion. That the organization and that the way that we worship God is superior to any other religion because it's just so logical and intelligent. And that you'd best join the Christians because they're the strongest group, they're the, the closest knit group, they're the, the, the best uh, best organized, and you know they have a mindset and ideology that is tough to be defeated. It would be too bad if people had the impression that you better not mess with Christians because of Christians. When the reality of it is is that there's nothing great about followers of Jesus. But everything is great about Jesus. And here's a man who distinguished himself as king of Judah because he made God's problems God's problems. And God delivered him. Let's go back to Isaiah 38 now. I want to ask you a question. The question is, if you were sick, today when we're sick, a lot of times we see a doctor. That is, you all do. I probably will when I'm sick enough to die. You see a doctor, and the doctor says, you're going to die. Well, in this case, uh, Isaiah was the messenger that came to Hezekiah. And uh, Isaiah and Hezekiah have a variable, very amiable relationship. Isaiah gives Hezekiah the message from the Lord, and um, Hezekiah receives it. That is unlike most kings and prophets in their relationship. Usually the prophet comes in and says, Thus saith the Lord, and the king.
king says, I don't care. Not Hezekiah. So Hezekiah is sick. He's got it here's a boil or something. I don't and I don't know what the um, circumstances are, but I imagine it's a it's a disgusting sickness. And he's evidently in great pain and he the Lord comes to him and says, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now, have you ever asked yourself a question? I have many times. If today were my last day on earth, how would I spend it? If today were my last day on earth, how would I spend it? If this year were your last year that you live, how will you live it? What will be your priorities? I have been many times present with someone when they found out that their days are numbered. And I've learned that doctors oftentimes, when they tell you their days are numbered, normally they're very optimistic about how long you have left to live. Usually you have less than they say. And I'm not sure if they just want to keep you in good spirits, make you think you're going to live months instead of days, or days and weeks instead of days, or days instead of hours, but a lot of times the doctors are pretty optimistic about it. That's my experience. And when a doctor says, you know, call hospice. Set your house in order. I'm not going to try to help you on a path to healing because you're going to die. You're not going to recover from this. If that were this year and you had 360 prophetic days or 365 calendar days, 365 and whatever, what is it, a quarter or something like that, 365 and a quarter, whatever the reason is, we lose days in February sometimes, or get days in February, whatever it is. Anyway, uh, if you were told that, that that's how long you had to live, what would you do? You'd be amazed at how things that you think are very important and you're focusing on don't matter anymore. If you're trying to fix the car and you find out you're going to die next week, you don't care about fixing the car. If you try to buy a house and you find out you're not going to live through the year, you don't need the house anymore. If you're trying to get a promotion or a new job and you find out you're not going to live, you don't need the promotion anymore. Be amazed at how many things in life, when you find out that your days are numbered, have no significance. Now, I wouldn't argue for you today, don't do anything that shows that you plan on living very long. I and mean, that's not the argument this morning. The question is, when you're faced with limited amount of time, you realize how precious your time is. And when you realize how precious your time is, you realize how much things that you thought mattered oftentimes do not matter. And how often things which you gave little priority or very little concern to are actually very important. Um, how many of y'all are entertained by this Putin-Obama thing right now? Obama, it appears, and I, I, I think this is rather predictable, is trying to get America in a war right now. He's trying, he's, I mean, literally a guy who has cowed to the nations wants us to be, you know, in, in full-blown world war. Uh, that's what he, it seems like that's what he's trying right now. He's just pushing buttons and, and trying to make people angry. I'm a little frightened that he has, that he has the nuclear codes right now. Uh, I believe that he's trying to do what uh, Bill Clinton did uh, to George Bush, where you had some serious, serious threats. We had, remember when we had the Navy... Uh, that was attacked and, and had a bomb uh, that black, that killed a bunch of sailors. Remember when uh, Osama bin Laden committed some terrorist things and basically uh, Bill Clinton sent a missile off somewhere and said, yeah, you know, we sent a missile at him. And just to basically allow a terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, to really build up a great deal of strength. And so when uh, George W. Bush became president, really wanted to implement a lot of conservative uh, a lot of conservative um, economic <coughs> things. Instead, he had to spend eight years in, in war. And he spent eight years um, trying to make the world a safe place. And uh, that, you know, war is expensive and it's costly, and it's always easy to come behind someone who's had 
to take all their resources and put them into fighting a war and rebuilding nations. It's always easy to come by and say, man, they, they ruined the country financially. Uh, and it uh, looks like Obama's trying to do that right now uh, with Donald Trump. It seems like he's trying to make, you know, I mean, I, I heard he spent, sent special uh, forces into, was it the Ukraine or something like that? It's just not something a guy who's got three weeks left in the presidency ought to be doing or expelling. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not pro-Russia or anything like that, but expelling Russian diplomats three weeks before you leave the office is not the thing that a president should do. He's trying to put Trump in a situation where he has to make decisions and uh, do things that will distract him from repealing Obamacare and from dealing with economic issues and so forth. Um, and appointing Supreme Court justice, distractions, uh, those sort of things. A lot of times in life we get caught up in things that are nothing but that. They're just distractions. They're things that keep you from the important thing. I am a strong believer in scheduling things and making those things happen. And the reason I believe you ought to schedule things and make them happen is because if you don't, nothing will happen. There are, I was thinking about last week, I was thinking about last year, my New Year's resolutions for last year. One of my New Year's resolutions last year was to get Charlie to be on time for things. That was my New Year's resolution last year. And uh, so I was, what I was gonna try for, he was late to Sunday school this year, but it's a different year uh, so today, so. Charlie, you started off late. You stayed up all night, didn't you? Look at him. Did you work last night? Yeah. Uh, you stayed up all night working. Did you get paid overtime? Just for one hour. Isn't it? That's it? Yeah. Ugh. I think. Is he I'll coming, dragging into Sunday school looking like that for one hour overtime? <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, I. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of my New Year's resolutions last year. One of my other New Year's resolutions had to do with Tony and something I want to see him do. And I'm, all I got to do this year is just reset my New Year's resolutions and uh, keep working on them. I learned a long time ago, don't set goals for yourself because they're too hard to reach. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just setting goals for everybody else and uh, you know, seeing if I can improve their lives. <laughs> if this was my last year to live though, I'd want to have it well planned and I would want to focus on some priorities. Every one of those priorities would have something to do with this ministry. If this were my last year living on this earth, I'd want to set some priorities. And I'd want to set my house in order. And every one of those priorities that I would set in order would actually have to do with this ministry. You say, Pastor, what about Melissa? Both of us would probably have the same priority. I realized, you know something, it's the last year I can pastor this church. Next year, we're going to have to have a body of people that can get a good pastor. Knows how to do it. Melissa probably won't be able to go to church here anymore. Uh, it's just a lot of times not a good idea when a pastor is gone for his wife to be in the church. It's too hard for her to see changes. Uh, sometimes people um, just think that she's opposed to things even when she's not. I've seen that happen with pastor's wives when they're very supportive. But people think that they're not because a new leadership is guys different or whatever. So for both of us, we'd have the same circumstance. But you know, um, our life is the ministry, to be honest with you. If our life was the family we were born in, we'd live in Michigan or in Kansas or Arkansas or something like that. Our life isn't the family that we were born into. Our life is the ministry. And our life became the ministry because... Early on, we realized that we are eternal, not temporal beings. And so what matters to God is the only thing that matters in life. So we had to set our priorities. But believe you me, this would be a busy year for Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church if this were my last year. I've had people say this, and I think this is, this is a, great, a great concept. Everybody ought to have at least a year of their life that they give to the Lord. I mean, just a year of their life that the whole year just belongs to God. Uh, I really wanted to have that year, and I, I believe I did, um, when I was single and uh, when I was first in the ministry. I had decided when I was done with Bible college and didn't have an obligation to be married or anything like that, I decided, you know something? I'm just going to be 100% God's. 
My life is just, I'm just going to serve the Lord. I don't care where it is. Uh, I told, I put the word out. Anybody that needs anybody to serve the Lord with them, let me know. I told some missionaries, hey, if you got a couch I could sleep on, I could probably supply my own rice and beans. And I'll come serve with you. I'll work in the ministry with you. Uh, I narrowed it down when I was finishing school. I narrowed it down to two choices. There was a pastor in New Jersey that said, hey, you could come and help us. And there was a pastor in South Florida who said, hey, you could come and help us. And I ended up in Southeast Florida. I just wanted to serve the Lord with everything I had. I'll tell you something. I don't think I've had a rival year to that year in my life of seeing people saved and seeing the ministry grow. I don't think I've rivaled that year. We saw our church in Delray Beach in that year's time double. We just saw the church just, just grow to double. We saw things happen in that year. I didn't realize it then, but things happened in that year that never happened before. And um, since then, had just things haven't been. Those, those are just the best years of my life. And I think every Christian ought to have a time period in their life that you look back to and say, man, God had everything. And he was the priority. And I followed Him and I believed Him by faith and I just gave God everything I had. But that can't be probably the same year for everybody. But do you have one of those years? What if this year you went to see your doctor and your doctor said, this is it. You're done. You're not going to live any longer. What if that's, that's going to happen if the Lord tarries, you know. The day is going to come that's going to be your last year to serve the Lord. Or your last week or your last hour. It may not be a doctor that gives you the news. It may be a car accident. It may be a heart attack. It may be a stroke. It may be something, but if the Lord tarries, that year is coming in your life. And my question for you is, is there anything precious in your life? Is there anything that's eternal in the way that you live for the Lord Jesus Christ? I look at Hezekiah, and as Isaiah comes to give him this news, I think of a couple of perspectives. First of all, I think of Isaiah's perspective. Can you imagine getting to be a prophet to a king like Hezekiah, or beginning to be a prophet while you have a king who loves the Lord? Do you think Isaiah liked the message? No, he wanted Hezekiah to live. What about the people of Israel? Do you think Israel ever had a time period like they had under Hezekiah? I'm talking about Judah specifically. I think it rivaled it. This is, it's not in terms of greatness of the kingdom, you know, that we ruled the world. We're talking about your house and having peace with the Lord. And yet Hezekiah was told he only had a year to live and to get his affairs in order. If we were to look at Hezekiah's life, we see a man who had a spotless reputation that was later blemished by something that he did in the subsequent 15 years he was given. That is that he gave a tour to the king of, or to representatives from Babylon, showed them the treasures of the house of the Lord, which were later taken out of the house of the Lord as a result of that. But Isaiah confessed some things to the Lord. And uh, here's some things that he said. In verse 17, he said, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in, thy, in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee, that they go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And look at verse 19. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day, the father to thy children, shall make known thy truth. Isaiah or uh, Hezekiah said, Lord, dead people can't bring you glory. But live people can. And so I'm going to give you the glory. And that's what he lived his life for. You know, I don't know what your New Year's resolution would be for 2017, but if it had to be known by something, are there is there anything that might be a good reason to remember? You have years in your life that just kind of disappeared, and it takes a while to recall what happened in that year. Do you have years in your life that when somebody mentioned the year, you, you remember it? Remember what happened? There are years in my life, 2000, uh, 2001. 
2002. Those are some years in my life. I can tell you the events that happened. I mean, I just for the whole year, just tell you everything that happened. There are other years in my life, to be honest with you, that I look back to, and they they've morphed into a blur, a succession of days and weeks and months that are indistinguishable by anything that God has, you know, anything amazing that God has done. That's true of all of us. It'd be nice if 2017 wasn't one of those years. Pastor, how could we see 2017 be a great year? Well, I think two simple things, two words. Priority. Priority. Live like it's our last. Live like Jesus is coming and you don't know when He's coming. That's how we're supposed to live as believers. What I say unto you, I say unto you all, watch. That's Mark 13. We're supposed to be watching for Jesus. It's a priority. And number two, faith. Faith. Find in the Scripture the promises of what God wants to do and it says He will do and believe Him by faith. And you'll see God do great things this year. Hey, Bob, let's see. Let's, let's uh, dismiss the prayer. Father, thank you for the day, for the truth that we've seen in the Scripture. And I just ask your blessing on our church service to follow. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.